We're primarily going to be in Matthew chapter 6, if you want to find that this morning. We'll have a couple other places that we're going to be, but Matthew chapter 6 is our main text we're going to be in. This morning, I want to discuss the providence of God, an important aspect of, of who God is and part of His will that all too often we neglect in our own minds and thoughts, but is also critical to the character and the nature and the person of God. To get us thinking in that direction in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells the church in Philippi, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful Lord's Day morning that we can come here together as the people of God, as your church, as those who are bound around the common love for you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would deliver meaning and purpose to us this morning through the reading of your word, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, that you would conform us to your image, that you would cause us to worship you because of who you are. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We ask for your, your guidance and your provision in our church as well, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. When you're in a real bind in some sort of situation, whatever that may be, there's usually probably someone off the top of your head that you think, I need to call this individual. This person's going to be able to help me with this problem. Uh, hopefully, you have someone on that list, at least one name. Uh, if not, stay after service and make some friends. Okay. Um, uh, and for, for a lot of us who, who are married, when I think about that question, uh, I usually think about, well, I'm, I'm going to call my, my wife, my, my closest confidant, my closest friend, my, my partner in life. I'm, I'm going to call her and, and, and ask her to help me out. But that doesn't necessarily apply to every single scenario in life. While I love my wife and she's the most important human being on the face of the world to me, I'm not going to call her at 2 a.m. to pull me out when my truck is stuck in the mud. As much as her desire may be to help me in that situation. Y'all pause and think about getting a call at 2 a.m. to pull someone out real quick, how your wife would react. As much as she may love to do that for me, she may not be able to help me in that situation. So then I've got to have categories in, in my life of these are the people who I can call to, to help me in any given scenario, who, who can help me out in anything. In, in my op occupation as pastor, there's a, a list of people that I know. If I call this person, this thing will get done. But if I call this same person about this thing, they'll say, why are you calling me? I'll see you Sunday, okay? No one's ever said that to me before. Y'all are good. But there's, there's categories and lists of people. There, there shouldn't be, and if there is, hear me out, there, there shouldn't be one singular person that fits every category of need in your life, right? At very least, if you're over 18, there shouldn't be one single or two people that fill every category of need in your life. Uh, first and foremost, the enormous amount of pressure you're putting on someone to, to basically be holding your hand all through life as an adult, probably not something we want to do to each other, right? But there are people, there are individuals that you can count on in maybe different situations than another, but there needs to be someone in that mental list. Now, I'm, I'm obviously... Uh, joking when I talk about my wife's lack of desire to help me out at 2 a.m., pulling me out of the mud. She would be more than happy to. Uh, but there's even categories of... She didn't laugh at that one. There, there's even more categories in, in that as well when we talk about our spiritual life. There, there are some people that I know that, that though they may be there to help me in this way, they may not be able to provide much help in this direction. May not be able to, to be there for me in the same way. So who am I going to turn to in these times? What if every single person on that list that I call is unavailable or isn't, isn't going to make me a, a priority on that list? Or what if it is 2 a.m. and someone sees my name and turns their phone off? Who's going to provide a, a, a sense of, of care for the needs that I have? If it comes down to brass tacks, if it comes down to the direness of life, well, there's providential care at view in that. And that's what I want to focus on today from the scriptures is providential care. Whenever uh, we, we care to consciously acknowledge it or not, when we think of the providence of God, the first place that, that we need to start is God's providential care in all of creation in every moment at any given space in time. 
in the arrogance of the modern scientific world that we live in, that, that we're all participating in, in in some degree or another. There's a kind of a, a conscious idea that's come about that the way that God cares for his universe is he created it. He, he metaphorically, if you will, spun the top and just stepped back to, to see how it spins. Uh, but, but that's not at all when we look at the scriptures, how, how God cares for his creation, how he provides providence to his creation and then the way that he cares for it. Now, if you're going to say, well, I, I don't at all think that. I know and consciously understand that God in all things touches all things and has power over all things. So that's good. So you've never checked your phone for the 10-day weather forecast before you went to Rio Dosa or to the lake or planted. Okay, now that's not a sin. Okay, we're not going to go that crazy. But in our own ways, there's a lot of times where we've created a reliance on our understanding of how the world works rather than God's direct control of how our world works. Now, I think it's probably good to check the forecast before you plan any sort of activity or any, anything relating to, to your life. Uh, I don't want you to go to the beautiful mountains of New Mexico, which you all make fun of until it's time to have fun and you go across the border. I want you to check the weather. I don't want you to get caught in a blizzard, right? The God in his providence has given us the ability to somewhat understand what's happening with, with that aspect of creation. But rather, in, in, in even a practical and in a, a spiritual sense, do we have a conscious understanding that my God is in control of every aspect of all things in which he's created, that he providentially cares in the way of his creation's function, that he upholds all of these things? A couple of examples from the scriptures in Job chapter 5, verse 10, it tells us that he gives rain to the earth and sends waters to the field. In Psalm 104, in a couple of verses from there, it says he set the earth on its foundation so it should never be moved. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate. That may bring forth food for the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen men's hearts. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it's night, when all the beasts of the forest creep about. In the precise intricacies, almost tripped over that one, in the precise intricacies of the cosmos, God not only sets into motion these things, but scripture tells us that he directly involves himself in these things. Not just in that he, he cares for and, and moves and, and causes, but these things from, from the words that are given belong to him. His providence is that these things also are not just that he made, but he owns. He possesses these things. He's directed and actively involved in the movement of each particle of matter in all of creation by his divine providence. God's creative act at the very beginning that we're told, it's not simply that God rested on the seventh day and then just continued to rest for all of eternity. God is active in his creation, not just in the creating, but the sustaining, the providence of all creation. Now, this isn't just a, a poetic thought either. We can pull things from Psalm and, and, and one from Job, but also Jesus himself testifies to this reality in Matthew chapter 6, if you haven't found that yet. He, he brings up the discussion of God's direct providential care over the least of creatures. And he uses that as a discussion to talk about God's direct providential care over his image bearers as well. Matthew chapter 6, go down to verse 25, will you? Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? That last line, that last question, 
is obviously meant to be rhetorical. Jesus is trying to get everyone to understand if God cares for these beasts that don't bear his image, that simply have a very simple role in creation, that may have kind of a meaningless role to some in, in their function of creation, then wouldn't he not also care for you? But in the modern world that we live in, this question being read oftentimes doesn't come off as rhetorical. Because in the modern world that we live in, that in itself is a question. Does God actually care for his creatures, namely me? Does God providentially care at all about me or, or any of his people that he's created? In the Christian worldview, this is a rhetorical because we know God does care, because God does create, because God does give providence to people. Not just His people, but all of creation. Scripture tells us that the rain falls on both the wicked and the good. Even those who are still actively in rebellion of God receive the common grace of His providence. And He has a special care for them over and above the animals. But if you haven't noticed yet, we live in a post Christian age. We live in a sort of neo-pagan type in history where we've, we've abandoned so many of the principles of God that the Western world had, had built itself upon on, and now we've reverted back to the paganism from whence we were saved. And it may not be as clearly obvious sometimes. We don't necessarily go and see people dancing in birthday suits around trees anymore, right? but they certainly hug them, okay? There are certainly ideas that the, the, the lower creation, the trees, the rocks, the, the birds, though, the, though God does care about those things, but, but, but one of the, most, the largest neo-pagan things that we see happening is this rebirth of the low creation being better than God's image bearers. And mainly that's because they've slashed at the idea that we bear the image of God. That we are simply a natural product of accidents that have happened in this universe. One, one example of this uh, I saw on Twitter last week. It's called X now for some reason, but it's not as fun to say I X'd someone. I, I tweeted at them, okay? That's the, the nomenclature we're going to use. But some of you may be familiar with uh, Greta Thornburg. Um, uh, chuckles already. Uh, a, a climate change activist speaking about uh, fighting climate change not in fighting climate change, but fighting to prevent climate change while we fight. This quote will explain that to you. Uh, amongst other things, she proposed electrically powered tanks and fighter jets, and her reasoning was they carry more bombs. Hold on to that. Now, I'm, I'm assuming she just doesn't know how batteries work or are charged, because we wouldn't give any platform to someone so dull. At one point, th these are some direct quotes from what she said. She said, block the roads to gardens and farms so that the plants don't get overrun by these heavy, heavy tanks. She also stated, and this is the absolute icing on the cake, hand grenades, very important. If you use hand grenades, please use vegan grenades. No animal should have to give their life for all of this mayhem and chaos. They have a special sticker on them. You really can't miss them in the grenade market. Now, my initial viewing, I had the same reaction. It was mostly stunned silence as I stared at my phone screen, trying to figure, look for the sign of like the onion or the Babylon Bee, that this was a fake article. But it was real. Especially the grenade market comment was... Pretty funny. The last time I checked, Walmart stopped stocking those. But after the humor of it kind of faded off, I very quickly went from laughing at those comments made to a type of just absolute despair for the worldview that would promote those comments. The problem was not that we were having wars, that men, women, children were being killed, hospitals destroyed, schools being obliterated. The problem was that we were hurting the plants while we were killing each other. Do, do you see the neo-paganism in that? That the concern is not that we would destroy the image of God and man, but that we would run over our tomato plants with a tank. But that's the predominant worldview today. That, that video, that little clip of that interview, 
uh, had millions, nearing billions, watching it. And what was even more depressing was the comments who were supporting it, who were saying that this is the way. Now, this is not a comment on the green movement. This is a comment on the basis of the worldview of the culture of death that stands in opposition to Christianity. We should be more bothered by the death of plants and innocent little bunnies than we should be by children being orphaned, by men and women losing their lives in the act of war. And that's the worldview that is very quickly overcoming the world that you and me live in. We live in a neo-pagan culture that has so far abandoned the Christian heritage that we, we have thrived in for so long that now we cannot start with the question of do you know Jesus or do you know what it means to be saved? We have to go all the way back to the beginning of creation that says there is a God who has created things. That human beings bear the image of this God. That we are, we are a special part of that creation. That you indeed are more important than a rabbit or a sparrow or a bird or any of those things. That God has called us as His special creation. Because we're so quickly abandoning the truth of the Scriptures. We're now interacting with a worldview that believes that we're a matter of chance, that our very existence is random, it's just coincidence, it's meaningless, that no one cares who lives or who dies, just as long as you don't hurt the bunnies, that you're just a random clump of cells that descended and evolved over billions of years from stardust simply floating and bumping into other stardust. It's almost a direct mindset that Paul confronts in Romans 1, claiming to be wise, they became fools. But this, this also begs the question, before we get in, into more of, of what providence is, is are we adequately versed in the Scriptures enough that when we encounter that worldview that we can articulate the Gospel? It, it's no longer uh, an issue where, where it had been in the, the golden era of the church in America where people either were in church all the time or at least knew of Jesus to an extent that he was more than just the colonizing white man's religion which is basically what we're being delegated to at this point. Do we know the gospel enough? Can we articulate it in a way that shows my neighbor I love them, that they're a special creation of God? Do I know who Jesus is, who God is, the triune beauty and majesty of my God to explain it to someone who is just a blank page when it comes to Christianity? Because if we don't learn how to share the gospel with a neo-pagan culture... There's no stopping it. If we're not willing to learn how to share the gospel with a neo-pagan culture, we will be further plunged into it. The basics of that, the, ba the very basic fundamental core of that is, am I willing even now to evangelize my neighbor who is not yet a pagan? Am I willing now to reach to those who have some semblance of Christianity before my Grandkids and kids have to reach them as they're fully plunged into paganism. God's role is creator and sustainer. His, his providence in that is he does have promises for us if we are willing to go. That's one aspect of that that's beautiful and encouraging. But it's reliant on are you willing to go. But, but that sustaining, that providential care is, is a critically important for us to grasp, not just for that obvious first reason of evangelism. Yes, we know that we must go. We, we know that God has told us to go. But it's not just for my own comfort, but it's also for the sake of worship. If I don't rightly understand who God is, what is my worship going to look like? We, we worship God based on what has been revealed to us in His, in His Scriptures, but if I don't know those Scriptures, if I don't know the, the care and acting providence of God, how will I worship Him for being the providentially divine carer of the universe? I can't. And so my worship is inadequate when I'm culpable to have it be adequate. Knowing God's providential care and His sovereign guidance over this universe properly and biblically leads me to worship. 
understanding God's role not just in the creation but in the sustaining of creation directs my heart to worship. Do I know Him enough to worship Him in that way? He is both the God who is powerful and and creates all things, yet He tenderly cares for even the sparrows and His individual creatures, and most especially the ones made in His image. Because if I don't have a, a category for the providence of God that's connected to God's act of creation, which is connected to God's act of creating man in His image then what argument do I have against vegan hand grenades? If I have a shallow, superficial understanding of God's providence, I have a shallow, superficial understanding of God's act of creation, of why it matters that I should love my neighbor instead of kill my neighbor. This is one of those aspects of of God that is so intricately connected, tripped over that time, connected to every part of who God is. Does God care for His creatures? Go down to verse 30 of Matthew 6. But if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? But before we even get to that next verse, there's a condemnation in this understanding. Our our misunderstanding of God's providence is not that God is not providential, is not that God does not care for even the grass in this example. It's a lack of our faith in God's providence. It's a lack of my understanding of God's providence. Do I care enough to know God to know that He will care for me? That He will make tomorrow the sun rise the same way that it has risen before Verse 31, after the condemnation of, oh, little faith, and we're confronted with a mirror, do I have faith in the providence of God? Do I even know about the providence of God? Verse 31, therefore, do not be anxious. We're not even going to finish that verse before I have something to say. If we're anxious, go back to the end of verse 30. And that may sound scathing. Hast thou claim I have little faith? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I just did. Because that's exactly what I do to myself. If we are anxious of God's providence, it is not the lack of the evidence of God's providence in all of human history that's deficient. It is my faith in God's providence that is deficient. It is my inability to recognize my weakness and frailty as a human being who in all practicality has zero control over what happens in this universe. It's a, it's a sign of my lack of trust and faith in the God who made me, who puts His image on me, and who, where we're going to get, redeems and sustains me. But that first step is if I have no providence or confidence in God's providence, rather, that He will clothe the grass of the field, which is literally going to get trampled on when we walk outside. It's not God's fault for that. It's my fault for my lack of belief in that God and what He has done and the evidence He's provided. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first. Here's the, the, the cure for the problem at the end of verse 30, for the lack of faith. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. To the question of what will I eat, what will I drink, what will I wear, the answer was not be more anxious. Be more bothered and concerned. The the answer to, to the issues that are happening in our world right now where we're just headlong marching into probably one of the the largest cataclysmic wars that we've had in a really long time, is not to just stop watching the news and bury my head in the sand. Though that is convenient. You can keep watching Fox or CNN. I won't oust you if you're watching that one. But do so with the understanding that the first thing I must seek is God's kingdom. My anxiety is not linked to any kingdom of man. If it is, I hate to spoil the book of Revelation because you haven't read it yet apparently. All kingdoms of men will be gone. There will be no kingdom of man. 
even if your anxiety is linked to the particular kingdom of man that you live in. It should not be so. There is but one kingdom that God is primarily and most importantly concerned about. It has no flag or physical holdings in this current world. It is His kingdom. If I am anxious, the cure is not to seek my kingdom, my personal kingdom, the, the, the citizenship of my current kingdom, the kingdom of a, a, of a world around the world that I know nothing of. It is the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, why would He need to point out His righteousness? Because just as equally as the anxieties of this world is the anxieties of my place in the next world. And if I'm concerned with my righteousness, I have reason to be anxious. I have great reason to be anxious. But if I, my concern is for His righteousness and the death of Christ that places His righteousness on my account, I have no anxiety. There is no more perfect righteousness. Verse 34, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, don't get hung up on the, the food and the clothing themselves that, that are mentioned here. They're representative of the broader category of God's providence and the things that I even need. The, the daily things that I'm reliant on. The focus, rather, should be on verse 33, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The mental energy that we dedicate, that David dedicates, okay? Giant mirror in the back I'm looking at while I'm saying all of this, ladies and gentlemen. The, the mental energy that we dedicate towards the anxieties is a massive spitting in the face of God waste of what He's given me. Every minute spent in worry and fear over myself and my own anxieties of this world is a mockery of the gifts that God has given me. If I place my faith in the righteousness of Christ, if I'm seeking the kingdom of God, what is there to be anxious about? How is it that we can seek the will of the Father and focus on His kingdom, His pursuit, His righteousness, if I'm thinking about my kingdom or kingdoms, my own righteousness, my own will, and my own way. We can't. That's, that's why the answer was seek the kingdom, His kingdom. Seek a righteousness, His righteousness. There is no room in the equation of God's providence for me to be concerned about my own will and way in it. And that's kind of the, the other side of that double-edged sword where we go, yes, God is, has mighty providence and sovereignty over all this world. I have a God who is mighty, who can do all things, who's going to make His enemies, His footstool, rah-rah Jesus. And then the other side of it is where I mock myself saying those things because I think, oh man, I hope I can get this thing to accomplished and taken care of, that my own righteousness can do this, that these kingdoms of men will stand when I already know they won't. Who well, already know my righteousness won't stand? God's blade of His providence and sovereignty that cuts off the head of the enemy also cuts my heart. And it tells me I am incapable completely on my own. That if I really just want to be anxious today, I should think about myself and my works and my abilities and my plans, my nations, my things. Just like the grass of the field that God cares for, those things will be cast into the fire. Jesus' solution is very simple, that we would trust the God who formed us in the womb after His image, who placed our first parents in the garden and called them special, whom we are the prodigy of, who will continue to providentially care for us, not because I'm so swell, not because I'm so righteous, not because my plans are so good or my kingdoms are so great, but because of who He is. Because He is the providential God. It is part of His nature and His character. If God's providential care was based on my worthiness of being providented, He wouldn't care. But it is part of who He is. If I get the arrogance to think that God is as I am, sure, I should be afraid. I'm a fickle creature. 
My mind wanders and jumps from one thing to another. I can't pronounce three syllable words. But I have a God who's much greater and higher and more powerful than my puny human mind can comprehend. And if I want peace, I need to stop looking at myself for it. I need to look to the Prince of Peace. I need to look to the one who counted it worthy to bear my sins on the cross, not because I'm swell, but for the very fact that I am wretched. If God has to bear the wrath of my sin because of everything I've done, not me being worthy of His death, but I predicated it by the fact of my very nature as a sinner, why would I keep looking at my nature for peace? My nature for answer. Well, if this person wins this war, or if that nation wins this war, who cares? They're all a footstool. Yes, there are consequences to things that happen in wars and rumors of wars and things that I do and say and act in my own personal stupidity. But ultimately, the, the peace and security of the providential care of God is not dependent on me. Because if it was, it wouldn't exist. We've been going through the book of Daniel on Wednesday night, and if we just have not been paying attention, I'll repeat it for you. God raises up nations and He brings down nations. Sometimes those nations are exceedingly wicked, but God even uses the exceedingly wicked to bring about His own purposes. Even the most vilest human being can be used as God's puppet for His will. Stop looking at the vile puppets. Look at the hand that's controlling it. Look to the one who brings about all things. Ultimately, that brings us to uh, another point of of God's providence on the opposite spectrum of despair. There indeed exists an an ideology far more dangerous than the vegan hand grenade crowd. An ideology that clothes itself in in, in Christian language and and, and has the appearance of godliness yet denies its power. Paul from 2 Timothy 3 warns of that. One of the most heinous ideas conjured up in the American Christian mind because God has providentially cared so much for this nation is that God wants to bless me with health and wealth as a reward for my faith. There's absolutely nothing in you that deserves anything under than the wrath of God. God chooses to bless whom He chooses to bless. That the only difficulty that I face in life is because uh, you know, I'm not trusting God enough with uh, anything, so He given, hasn't given me health or wealth or great pocketbooks or, or anything like that. It is a doctrine from Satan that has been designed specifically to tickle your ears and while you're blushing, pull the wallet from your pocket. This is not a doctrine of providence, but of purse strings. The doctrine of providence isn't that God gives me those things that I want because He's good to me. The doctrine of providence is that God's will will absolutely be accomplished and there's nothing that man can do to thwart it. If His will be that I die in ashes and pour as a pot martyrdom, praise God. We don't like that. That doesn't give us the warm fuzzies. But that's the reality of God's control, not my control. Of God's will, not my will. I don't earn some sort of favor in the same way I don't earn a righteousness. It's the same understanding of God's providence in God's providence. In Sunday school, we discussed Job this morning. In God's perfect providence, in His care for Job, He let Job suffer a multitude of things. In God's providential care for you, God will bring about fire and pain and discipline. Because the most ultimate good that God brings about is that you look like His Son, not that you get what you want. I think one of the greatest lessons that we have for providence practically that God gives us is He gives us children. There are things my children may want. If they got everything they wanted, we'd have just a freezer full of ice cream. Okay? Amen, I heard that. Randy's rowdy this morning. (laughs) Ain't no one else on this side of the room that's that low, is it? Was that Randy or was that? Oh, okay, it was the other person who's that low over there. There are many things that our children want, that they think that they need, that they desire more than anything else in the world. 
But you as a good parent know and understand that what they need a lot of times is the exact opposite of what they want. And if us as fallible, dumb sacks of flesh can figure that out, how much more powerful and wise do you think that the God of the universe is? Oh, but God, it's really a need. I, I, I need to, to get to this point. I need, I need this, 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 this amount of this. I, I need this to happen. God knows what you need. If he cares for the sparrow that is dead tomorrow, if he cares for the morning dove that I peg out of the sky, he most certainly cares about me. And sometimes that means he cares enough about me that he will allow me to go through trial, that he will allow me to go through difficulty and pain and suffering. And if I'm looking at myself and my wish list, I will not experience the peace. And if I have, a, have created this object of who God is, that he gives me anything I want, I will not be worshiping the one true God. Ephesians chapter 1, real quickly, we're going to run through this. Starting in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gives us a picture of this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Full stop. We could end the sermon there with that verse. He has blessed us in Christ. If you want to add anything, if you think that there's a lacking in His blessing by blessing us in Christ, then you don't get it. There's no greater blessing than to be in Christ. There's no greater thing that we could have or receive or obtain. That's it. Full stop. Blessed are those who are in Christ in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The location of my blessing even is not on this earth that will be soon be destroyed with fire. It's in the heavenly places. I shouldn't want anything else. And then he explains, starting in verse 4, he explains why this is such a wonderful blessing, even as he chose us and him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Not only do I have the, the greatest blessing, but I'm given the promise that he's chosen to make me in the image of Christ, that I will again be righteous that I won't be in rebellion against the One who's created me. He predestined us for adoption to Him as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purposes of His will. The greatness of the blessing of Christ isn't because of my will. It's not because of my greatness, my righteousness. So I should stop looking at me for that. I should stop looking at me for peace for assurance, for rest, for comfort. When the greatest of all spiritual blessing I can receive is in Christ, I should look to Him for that. For my peace, for the providence. Verse 7, in Him we've received, uh, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ. If I have to emphasize it any harder, I'm going to lose my voice. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him. Break the mirrors of spiritual comfort. I don't want to look into me for hope, for peace, for joy. Because that's not anywhere in this divine math problem that God has set up. He says, Him, my action, He, His will, His providence, His grace, His joy. But in the rebellion that remains in my heart, I go, well, I wish I was more righteous in my actions. Why can't I this? Why don't I have that? Why don't I look to the cross of Christ who's given me that? 
He continues in, in Ephesians 2. He carries through an idea that we're, we're going to skip. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and when you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind that were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He starts with Ephesians 1. This is the the graciousness that's been given. This is the majesty of God, the providence of God that's been displayed upon you. This is from whence you came. And more often than not, the rebellion that remains in our hearts go, I like from whence I came. I'd like to go back there every now and then. It's a great place to visit. That's where I can get some pride. That's where I can get some more sinfulness that makes me happy and gives me a temporary comfort. Our goodness is not in the view of God's will because our goodness is non-existent. And the goodness of the natural flesh is non-existent. I gave the illustration a while back of chocolate-covered... What were they? Brussels sprouts. The old nature is chocolate-covered bull you-know-what. It looks appealing. It may even have an aroma that's pleasing. It's prepared so beautifully. This is what I'm used to. This is my favorite dish. But if we've received the joy and the grace and the beauty and the deliverance that Christ has brought to us, the pin from the nose has been removed, and the second we take the bite, we realize what it is we've been mulling on. But in verse 4 of chapter 2, he, he opens the eyes of the blind and he, he gives us the understanding of stop looking at yourself in the old nature. I know it's wonderful, but look at what Christ has done. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, not because of the greatness of myself, but the love that He gave to me, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive by Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places of Jesus Christ. Grace, grace, grace. If I'm fully dependent on the grace of God for my status before Him, why am I so bothered by my own flesh's appeal to satisfy itself? Why am I looking for something of this world and of myself and of my own will and desire to give me peace from anxieties? That's literally where they come from. It's like going to Taco Bell to find something to settle your stomach. You will not find it there. But that's what we return to. And the graciousness of our loving, providential God screams out from the Scriptures, you've been saved by a grace while you were still in rebellion. And yet you return to the, 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 the gruel. Why would we waver in, the, in doubt over God's personal plan and care for me as His creature if He is willing God in Himself to bear the wrath of the Father and die in my place while I'm still a sinner? He's willing to, to complete this beautiful divine act of redemption. And yet I still worry about foreign wars that are happening on a temporary earth. Do the things that happen today matter? Absolutely they do. You're not listening if that's what you got out of that. They matter in the fact that those people need Jesus. They matter in the fact that if I'm more distracted by the work of Satan than by the grace of God, I have completely lost the plot in why God is worthy of worship. God is so abundantly rich in mercy and steadfast love towards me. What evidence or cause do I have to doubt His care? And that is a rhetorical question because the answer is none. No other answer is acceptable. In verse 7, we're given an insight to that divine will in Ephesians 2.7 so that in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us. 
Nowhere in this trail in Ephesians is there any sort of a hint that he wants to give us love and grace and kindness and eternally display that aspect of himself because I'm so good. So why do I return to the well of the depth of depravity of my own heart and consciousness to find peace? God's motivation in the redemption of his people is to display his grace towards undeserving wretches who literally hate him. You will never find a more poignant picture of what grace looks like than that passage in Ephesians. And not only does he display a a love towards those who are in rebellion against their creator, but he chooses to make us part of his divine plan for eternity, not for ourselves, for his glory to be shown. For God's purposes to be fulfilled. It's kind of like those videos on the internet. I know what time it is. You don't have to tell me. It's kind of like those videos on the internet where people are like hanging seven people linked an arm into a well to rescue a cute little puppy in the bottom of the well. Except you're not a cute little puppy. You're a vicious dog who's tearing to pieces the people who are trying to rescue you. And they find you worthy of rescue anyway. Or an even better picture, a more biblical picture of the way Paul puts it, you're the rotting skeleton of the puppy at the bottom of the well. Who even if you could jump that high, you wouldn't. And we're redeemed and we're rescued. We're marvelously delivered from that. Last, last two passages, then we're done. Ephesians 2, the conclusion he brings us in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing as the gift of God, not a measure or result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To summarize this whole point of God's providential care as seen in the most basic level of our salvation, Romans chapter 8, the very end of that chapter, starting in verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That good is being known by Christ and Christ being known by you. That good is not brand new jacked up truck, okay? That good is even though God takes everything away, God, that, that God pulverizes me into a pulp, I've been raised with Christ. For those who are called according to His purpose, verse 29, for those He formed new, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He called, and those He called, He justified, and those He justified, He has glorified. The God who holds all things in the palm of His hand, from the greatest thing in this cosmos to the most tiniest microcosm that you can't even see with the human eye, holds my salvation in His hand. What in the world am I worried about? What in the world do I have to be in anxiety over? The greatest thing that could ever happen to a rebellious sinner has in Christ's will and providence that he's delivered me. And if I place my joy and my peace and my assurance in anything outside of that, I will not have any of those three things. I will have no joy, no joy, no peace, no assurance because I'm looking to myself for something that only God can do and has done for me. God is glorified in all circumstances. He sovereignly crafts all things that bring, are brought about and that come to pass for my good. Both of the things that crush and pulverize me and the things that feel like a mountaintop experience. The Father who holds the cosmos in the palm of His hands, who created all things, things even unseen by the eyes of man, knows my name. That is what gives us peace. It's that God would even care to know me and that he indeed does. As we close, I I want us to to draw our attention to that original question. Who is it that I can trust when I'm in the greatest of need? Who is my refuge from the storm? Who can I count on to to help me in a time of trouble? Who is a friend closer than a brother? You're picking up on the biblical language here. 
if we doubt the providence of God, we can most assuredly doubt the providence of any living creature. There is but one being who is providentially caring for us in all times and all seasons and all frames of life. And that is the one who hung on a cross to bear the wrath of God on my wretched account. And there is no greater peace than the fact of knowing that he will return in power, not in a manger as a baby, but he will come riding a horse, that he will come with the sword, that he will bring about the justification of all things according to his will. And that while all things that I know and love and familiar with on the face of this earth will be changed, the one riding that horse knows me. He knows my face. He knows me. There is no one else. There is nothing else. There is no confidence, no provider or standard or justifier apart from Jesus Christ alone. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the blessed providence that you give us, Lord. Lord, we, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about your providential care, but just to look at the way that you love your sinful creation, the way that you love us that are undeserving, that you've provided a way in Christ for us to be made right, you've given us a justification that though there is no way on our own that I can have a peace with God, you make the way of peace. Lord, we are a people just absolutely marked by our anxieties, marked by our troubles and our concerns, even though some may be very legitimate, Lord. But if we have a full confidence in faith, if we are seeking your kingdom and your righteousness, you've given us the answer, the deliverance from that, that we would have a peace beyond all understanding, Lord. God, help us to get over our own will and way and plan and trust in your care and providence. In Jesus' name, amen.